Welcome, everyone, to Inside the Birds TV with Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan. And, of course, we got a special guest we'll get to in a second. Just want to let you know that ITB TV is powered by DraftKings, the number one rated sportsbook app. Download the DraftKings sportsbook app right now and start playing your online casino games. And when you do, make sure you use the promo code ITB to get your bonuses. All right, well, we're very happy to introduce our guest today, and that's Trey Thomas, former Eagles Pro Bowl left tackle, turned Philadelphia media personality, and now all 22 tape breakdown guru. Trey, thanks for joining us, man. We really hey, appreciate man. it. man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Always, always. Now, you've got a new YouTube page called In the Trenches with Trey Thomas, and uh-huh. everybody should subscribe to it immediately. Um, you're doing a lot of great all 22 breakdown. R- very descriptive. We love how what you got going on, Adam and I. Um, you have an inaugural post up right now breaking down Andre Diller's rookie season, and that's one reason we wanted to have you on. We've been talking a lot lately uh, about the left tackle situation with the Eagles, about Andre Dillard, Jason Peters, and back and forth, and we really wanted to you know, tap into your thoughts now that you've broken down all the tape on Andre Dillard and really get into what you saw and what you describe in your video in the trenches with Trey Thomas. On, well, one um, of the things that I looked at first is – um. One thing I can say about Andre Dillard, man, he's extremely athletic. He's not like usual. Usually when you see young offensive linemen, they're laid off the ball at times because they're not used to the cadence and all that. It seemed like right away he came in, got a hang of that, and and he doesn't take any wasted steps. And as an offensive tackle, that's what you want to see when you see a young offensive lineman. You want to make sure that he's not taking any false steps. He doesn't have any hitch coming out of this set. And also, if he's able to – catch that cadence and be one of the first to move. Because when you go back and you look at the offensive tackles as a whole, you look at Jason Peters and Lane Johnson, they're usually the first ones out of the gate. And one of the things that you see as young offensive tackles when they come into the game, they're laid off the ball, which creates problems. So that's one of the things I can see right at the gate, that he understands the cadence, the timing of it, and the anticipation of it, and he gets out really quick. Now, as I continue to watch him, his first action against Washington was in 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 an unbalanced stance where they brought him in as the extra offensive lineman, and they put him over on the right side against Kerrigan. This is his first game, (laughs) and you put him in a situation where he's never been in that particular type of stance. And a lot of people think that, hey, man, if you can play left side, you can play right side. It's not that easy. You know, um, the way I I would tell somebody, just like how he explained, the difference between being in a life and right-handed stance is if you write with a right hand, Try to write with a left hand. It's it's extremely difficult. And his first taste of real NFL action was getting out there on the right side, and he has to go up against Kerrigan. He got off the ball really quick, but he overset him because he just felt awkward being in space out there. But um, as I continue to watch him, and they put him out there right tackle a couple times, and then when he moved over to left tackle, you can see he was a little bit more balanced. But I think what they were teaching him, uh, I know Coach Stoutland teaches like a lot of underhand hook, uh, offensive tackles taking on the bull rush. And that can hurt you sometimes if you're not being – because you, you're always catching. And I felt like for the first couple games, especially when he went into Minnesota and got a lot of snaps, you could tell like he was out there catching. And you cannot be like that as an offensive tackle. Lane does it a lot. But for, for uh, Dillard, I think he needs to be in a little bit more balanced stance so that he can punch. So now – you can switch off games. You don't give up as much ground when you're getting bull rush. And as you can see, I, I saw that he was getting a lot more comfortable um, until when he got to that Chicago Chicago game, posture was totally different. He started delivering his hands, punching, and doing all the things that we expected him to do. But, you know, I think that this is just a learning curve. He has to continue to grow. Trey, through your video, which we could find on YouTube, uh, Inside the Trenches with Trey Thomas, it was very clear to me through that the 20 minutes that I watched that it wasn't really about strength. That that was a big surprise to me and very little to do with it. It was his hand usage was really poor, particularly in the beginning, and then I obviously got better. When you were a rookie in 1997, do you recall, was it the hands, power, footwork? What were the kind of struggles that you had as a rookie? Right out the gate, you know, I had to learn offensive tackle just from uh, when I was in college. You know, I came in as a defensive end. And then my, my coach there, Coach Jimmy Higgins, is the one that taught me the position. So when Juan took over, it was the same concept. You know, he started picking up where I left off from what I was learning in college. And then Juan just took it to another level. So one of the things I think I had to just get really get used to was the speed of the game. And then Juan just kept drilling, okay, 
this is how we want to set if we want to work vertical if we want want to work 45 and when to shoot the hands i think that was one of the things that i struggled with is when the the timing of it because you hear a lot of old school offensive line coaches they say well hey man once that shoulder if you were looking at a defensive end and once his shoulders turn to you then let your hands fly well if you wait that long your ass is already in trouble you know so <laughs> Juan started teaching us how to look at the stance and um, start de de determining where we want to be in our stance, where we want to get to, and shooting your hands and just working the timing of that. Of course, when you say Juan, uh, for those watching, it's it, Trey is referring to Juan Castillo, who was the longtime offensive line coach for uh, Andy Reid, and especially when Trey was drafted. And uh, he is regarded as one of the best offensive line coaches in the league. I, I want to Absolutely. ask you, yeah, I want to ask you, Trey, when you mentioned about the difference between playing right tackle and left tackle and then them throwing them out early at right tackle or extra tackle there. There have been guys that we've seen, whether it's Eagles or the NFL, that have been able to make that adjustment. Todd Harriman comes to mm -hmm. mind as someone who was seem able to seamlessly move from right side to left side. So what does it take to be good at it like the way Todd was? And, and why are some people just – naturally just they don't adapt seamlessly where's the difference there well it took him a while though to be able to switch like that like one of the things that happened with me in college is that we flip flopped a lot we would always go from right side to left side it, it was always practice but Andre Dillard had never been in a right-handed stance never throughout his football career he was always a left tackle and so that's why I think with schools you need to be able to get these guys to work both sides even when you go back Vitae was a guy that could switch like that as well where you can put him out at left tackle, you can put him out at right tackle, you can put him in at guard. He he handled himself pretty good in situations out there, but you have to go out there and work it from time to time. If you get used to being in a left-handed stance all the time and you're always taught to punch inside out, I always want to punch inside out, throw my inside hand first and then only bring my outside hand if I really need to. So you kind of treat it like boxing, okay? So now it's inside, outside, inside, outside. You never throw your outside hand first because if you throw your outside hand first, a defensive end cleans that, you're done. There's nothing else you can battle with. So now let's switch you over to the right side. And now your outside hand now is, you know, is what was in your inside hand. And you throw that hand just out of just instinct because you're used to doing it. And a DN catches you, you're done. And it's just a lot of muscle memory that happens when you're on one side all the time. I think schools need to work on switching guys a little bit more. But, I mean, I think for Dillard, it was just because he had never been on that other side of the ball. So, so Trey, you made it very clear. That the one issue that he had is with his hand usage. It was certainly not anywhere close to what you want. Is that mm -hmm. something that's taught? Is it just repetitions? How do you get your hand it's usage taught. to be better? Okay. It has to be taught. It has to be taught. Everything, everything with an offensive line, this is an unnatural position. Everything has to be taught. And also, and another thing, I mean, sometimes you're going to have to get your ass kicked. You know, you're going to have to, you have to trust the technique. You have to work it. And you have to go through, you have to take your lumps. Every offensive lineman in the game has gotten put on their ass and had to pick themselves up, learn from it, and move on. And that's what you have to do. But I, I feel with Dillard, you had to get him in a situation where you knew he was a puncher. Don't make him a grabber because now – if he's only 310 or whatever, and you have him out there taking on DNs, catching, I mean, you know, he's going to get blown back. And, and with this game, it's all about confidence. You want a young player to feel confident when he steps out there on that field. And you don't want him feeling unsure of himself because then now he gets catching, his balance is off, and yada, 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 and then everything else. I mean, you got a $100 million man behind you, you know? So you better be sharp with your game. So one of the things I was wondering, Trey, when watching your breakdown on YouTube, uh, and that's uh, Trenches with Trey, is I guess because you mentioned early on his hands were low. He didn't have them up in the in the punch position, right? And then you showed later in the season that he did have his hands up high. And then in the same – I think it was against Seattle. And then the same game you saw him start to get down again. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is it coaching that – because you also noticed, yes. noticed that – that Lane Johnson also doesn't start with his hands up. So are they just coached differently than you? And do you feel like how, if that's the way they're coached, how is it Lane can be so successful that way? And Andre yet was struggling with it. Okay. Well, all right now, because I got to be careful with this. All right. So, so <laughs> yes, it's being coached because, uh -huh. you know, because I want to get back into this. So I got to be careful now. So yes, it's being coached. 
and okay, so you say, all right, Lane Johnson is successful with it. What about the times when he gets caught out there lazy with his outside hand and he gets hit with an outside move against the Dallas clip where he went out there and laid his hands? He didn't punch. So you get caught leaning. So, yeah, you can be successful if you have a DN that's always going to run into you every time and it's a bull rush, but then you get picked off with games. Look at how many times when you look at lanes sometimes where they get hit with games a lot, you know, because you're out there leaning and you get caught. You know, I just feel like for me and the way I was always taught, you want your offensive linemen to be punchers because it makes the game a lot easier. Now, it doesn't make it easier. It, it just – you don't – it keeps you in a better posture – for if you get games, if you have to switch something off, uh, you don't get too locked in on stuff. It creates separation between you and the defensive lineman. So for me, I always wanted to be punching and work the posture. Now, one of the things that you have to do when it comes into punching is now you have to work the timing of it. And that's something that has to be drilled every – what we used to work offensive line, like pass setting, like every two, two, three days out of the week. You know, when you're only having like a four day practice, we spent at least three days really focusing on the timing of the punch, the technique that goes behind it, shooting hands and all that counting steps. You know, so it's something that has to be drilled. Trey, you said throughout your your, your first video that really <laughs> Andre Jello needs to wear a knee brace. You yes. seem to be pretty pissed off about it. Let's let's call it like it is. You're you were angry that he wasn't wearing one. A do most offensive linemen that you've played with, do they wear them? And B, why should you wear one? Well, well, yeah, okay, so, yeah, a lot of guys don't wear them. Some For whatever reason, they feel like, you know what, I, I get to the NFL now because everybody has to wear them in college. You have to wear the Don Joyce or whatever the knee brace is now. I wore Don Joyce. Everybody has to wear them up into college, and then once you get out of college, you get to the NFL, and now you feel like you want to look sweet. You want to look cool. <laughs> Man, we're not in a damn fashion show. You know – 60% of the injuries in the NFL are from lower body injuries. You see offensive linemen all the time getting rolled up. You get, you know, just like on the one particular sack where uh, Wentz fell into Dillard's knees. You see it all the time. Most of their knee injuries are from friendly fire when you're getting rolled up behind you. So why not protect your knees? Every offensive lineman now gets to the professional level and they feel like, oh, it, it slows me down. I don't need you out there running a damn four or five. I need you out there to feel like a goddamn tank so you can take on whoever you're going up against. That's my what, take on it. Why do you think he chooses not to wear one? Do you think that – I, I know comfort or personal – laziness, anything like that you it's wouldn't not, do that? You know, it's not something that, that – they don't feel uncomfortable. Check, check out the knee brace. When you get a chance, put one on. See how you move around. It's just that people don't like the bulky look to it. You know, for whatever reason, you want to get to the NFL and look sweet. You know what looks sweet? being able to play 16 games. That's what looks sweet. You know what looks sweet? Being able to finish your career and don't have that big-ass zipper down the middle of your knee because that's what's going to happen if you keep playing this game without any knee braces. Look at how many offensive line, even Lane, Kelsey, all of them, they, they, they missed time from knee injuries over something that could have possibly been prevented if you had on some knee braces. Mm -hmm. You can find Trey's videos in the trenches with Trey Thomas on YouTube. So, Trey... When you were breaking down the Chicago game, some of that tape looked outstanding. Like, you could see why he was a first-round pick. Then you saw the hand usage, where you're talking mm -hmm. about playing playing catcher, which you can't do because you're letting the guy get into him. If, if you had to mold what what Andre Dillard Trey could be in, in three to five years, how good could he be? I think he could be really good. I, I really think Andre Dillard could be picked right up where – I left off JP, took, took, took it to a whole nother level. And I think Andre Dillard can be that same type that fits right back in and continue to be that long stay offensive tackle that, that this city has grown used to. I think he can be good. He does a solid job at run blocking. I think his, his pass protection is getting there if he does it the right way. I think also, too, he needs to – and I, also, too, my, my wife keeps messing, trying to get me to stop saying that. So that's a bad habit of mine. But also, I think that – um if he continues to learn when to set at a 45 and when to set vertical, you see, because there are a couple of times when you see him set at that 45, where if it was one of the rushes against in Chicago, where, um, where he was rushing up against 94, I, I never really got into getting everybody's name. So I always give them their numbers. Leonard, Leonard Floyd. Leonard yeah, Floyd. Leonard yeah, Floyd. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So number 94. So he, he, because he set at a 45, the thing about setting at a 45 if you don't make contact on your third kick, 
then now you're going to shorten the corner. And you saw him a couple of times where he takes that 45 set, he takes two kicks, and then once you get to your third, if you haven't made contact, you have to drop your outside foot, which opens the lane for the defensive end to take on the rush. You saw against um, Dallas where he took that set, but he opened that outside foot, and at the, the end was able to get a swipe on the uh, on Wentz's hand, and the ball ended up being a, a incompletion. Could have been a fumble, but uh, Wentz's hand was uh, going forward. But you know, stuff like that has to be drilled. It has to be corrected. It's something that you cannot let slide because if not, it becomes a habit. And a habit is an extremely hard thing to break when it comes to technique and with, with within the trenches. Trey, r- real quick, because I want our viewers and listeners to understand a little bit more about what you're saying there. Um, when we talk about setting as an offensive lineman, you keep talking about 45. I want people to understand yes. you're talking about the angle and the direction of the yes. set. There's a okay. vertical set where you just yeah. go straight back, correct? Yeah. So, okay. So when you look at an offensive line protection, you have three schools of thought. You can either have a jump set where you want to get out there. It's a three-step drop. You want to get in a defensive end's face extremely quick, or you set at a 45-degree angle, or you set vertical. I was a vertical setter, knowing that I had to understand how to count steps because the weakness of a vertical set is bull rush, and you went into a game knowing that. But with a 45 set, the weakness is if you don't make contact on your third, on your by your second kick, then some, you got to be ready to get, get on your horse and be able to run in by the quarterback or you can mess around and get picked apart with games. So, you know, it's it's based off of what school of thought you want that offensive lineman to have or what you want to do as a coach. But for me, I like vertical setting because it makes it a lot easier for you to to time it, work on your timing. Also, you can work with 45. I Knowing the game the way I know it now and the way I see it, I probably would have changed the way I attack diff- different defense, I mean, defensive ends. Um, I may have one to go 45 because based off of his stance a couple times or change it up and switch it up to vertical based off his stance. But now, you know, that's why I look at the game a little differently now and would say, hey, man, it depends on what you want to do. But you have to know what's what's the outcome of that. What could, What's the negative if you choose that route? Trey, one of the things that people are a little bit concerned about is Andre Dillard's weight, somewhere between three, 310 and 315. When you were a rookie, then second, third year, how long did it take you to get to the right weight and strength uh, over your career? Man, we were playing big all the time, man. Like we, this was a totally different era back then, man. All oh. of us were about 340, 350. It was nothing for us to be that big, you know. But now I think the game is a lot different where you're going to see an offensive lineman play around that 315, 310 range, which I'm cool with. But th- now when you're at that weight, you have to – your technique has to be sharp. You, you're not going to be able to sit out there – and just catch all the bull rushes because you don't have that weight behind you. You're going to give up ground. So now your technique really needs to be sharp if you're going to play lighter. And I think you see a lot of offensive linemen are playing, being a lot leaner now. You look at Lane's uh, pitcher last year when he took the pitcher and his abs all ripped up and everything. You know, this is, offensive linemen are totally different from when I came into the game. Well, is that a response to the fact that edge rushers now, Trey, or tend to be smaller and lighter and faster than they were back when you played, when you could find guys 280, 290, even 300 playing the ends? Yeah, uh, I think so. You know, you guys are a lot more athletic, but I think athletes in general now are a lot more athletic. You know, Mm -hmm. they get a little bit smaller, except for now when you're looking at those three techniques, the bigger guys on the interior, where now you have some of these guys about 320, 340, and they sitting up there in the middle on the defensive side of the ball. But, um, you know, you're starting to see where, just especially at tackle, that guys are just playing a lot leaner now. Let me ask you, um, because we talked about you being a rookie and what you played at, but also um, the year one to year two jump is so big in any player at any position's career and not having these OTAs for Andre Dillard here in year two to get better on some of the things you're pointing out. How difficult will that be for him to improve without having that under his belt? Uh, I I think it could be a challenge, you know, just because there is certain stuff that you going out and doing cone drills or different little timing stuff that, you know, you just have to go through. You have to feel that pressure. You have to feel that bull rush. You have to feel how it's going to work where you have a guy working against you. So um, I think it could be a challenge, but I mean, that's, that's everybody right now. So everybody's going to come in on the same playing field. I think for him it's just more working the timing, getting your set down. And then once training camp goes in, I feel like they really need to challenge him in training camp. 
You know, there's no getting around that. He needs to get pushed. He needs whatever that defensive end that's out there that's practicing against him, he needs to come at him a couple times just to make sure that he's tight. Now, I came from a school of thought that I felt like our practices were extremely physical, especially on Wednesdays and Thursdays. We used to go after it, and then we would tone it down on Fridays, and I always felt a lot stronger going into games that way. I think that, you know, you're going to have to challenge him in, in training camp to get him up to speed. Trey, you worked briefly under Chip Kelly uh, on the offensive line. You worked for Jeff Stallon. Give us an idea of Jeff Stallon, how he teaches, what he teaches, and uh, what's your evaluation of Jeff over the years with the Eagles? Um, I like Coach Stallon. I think he's an extremely passionate, energetic guy. You know, he comes in, you know, makes his guys want to battle for him. Um, and, and, I, and I like some a lot of the run stuff that he teaches. I find, just to be personally, I find that when it comes to pass protection – I don't think that it's as sharp as it should be. When I look at, when I watch film and I see guys getting beat, it's one thing if you're getting beat and you, and it happens, but if you're getting beat from the same thing, if it's games, if it's a blitz situation that's coming up or, you know, uh, you're catching all the time instead of changing it up and punching, then now I start looking at, well, it can't be the player. It can't always be the player, especially if it's, scheme stuff that you're getting beat with then now I start looking at all right well coach you're gonna have to accept some responsibility for this too because where's the correction and mm -hmm. I feel like as a coach if, if you see a problem this should be corrected we should not continue to get beat on TE simple games a tackle tackle stunt or you know sliding away from the protection that's something that should be corrected right out the gate because you know it's a copycat league and you're going to see teams continue to test you with the same thing until you pick it up. One thing That's I want to add, okay. Jeff. One thing I want to ask Trey here on a follow up. Let me get let me get a water real quick. Come you on. got it, man. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Shameless plug for Pino's Palais when you did yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you did that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Say what now? We got them okay, all so, fired so, up. So let me ask you a question then, as a follow up. How much when it when it comes to the tackle and stunt, or the games up front? How much of it is communication between the offensive linemen and how much of it is coaching? I think some of it is communicate, but it has to be coaching. You know, you have to drill it in practice. Why is it that, okay, let's look at the Dallas clip that I posted. If you go back and you watch that clip. That game was it, a tough one. <laughs> it was a tough yeah, one to watch. But the first set that I showed where it came from the nickel, you know, it was a simple pickup, but you don't make the correct call. Now, why was that not drilled in practice? I knew from my notes that number 54 is the known rusher. So all they did was come out with it in a nickel front. I know that you saw a defensive end, a defensive tackle over Kelsey, and then a DN out here, and then you got 50, 54, and 48. What you do in that situation, hey, 54 is the known rusher. Now we have a four down front, and now those two linebackers are just regular linebackers. You just made a nickel front. Why was that not talked about in practice? Why was that not drilled? Why did you slide away from the protection? Let me give you this real quick. That was a three-jet protection. In slide protection, you have the slide side. Is, if it's three-jet, it's going to be the right side of sliding. If it's two-jet, it's the left side sliding. Now, the way you can tell if it's a slide protection to the right, the back is usually, usually to the left of the quarterback. And so if you're sliding to the right, then that means that the back has a dual read for anything that's maybe a little bit over center to anything outside to the left. So what you do in this particular situation is you say, hey, number 54 is our down lineman, is our rusher. He's the known rusher because you know what, based off of film, that 54 is the guy that they run a lot of their games with, a lot of their stunts with, a lot of their blitzes with. So you make him the down lineman, you make him the rusher, then you say, all right, running back, your dual read is number 50 and 48, and now we can keep the slide side to the right. Lane should have set out there for the nickel. Brandon Brooks should have set for the end that was crashing. And then now they would have switched off that little TE because the backers bailed. That sack would have never happened. But why was it not talked about in practice? Because I guarantee you that was not their first time showing you that blitz. All right, so, Trey, we got one more for you before we get yes. you out of here. And by the way, I just have to make this known for our viewers. When I was a young reporter coming into the Eagles locker room circa 2005, 6, 7, you are in the back corner. You said like three words. You gave this kind of glare to people like you weren't talking because that's what offensive linemen do. They don't talk. <laughs> and now we got you rambling. We got you talking so much that you're, you're, you're like working up a sweat. You need water. 
I we love the personality football. of Trey Thomas. <laughs> we love the personality. He's fired yeah. up. Yeah, he's fired up. Yeah, well, I, could, I couldn't talk back then. You know, I had to keep it all a secret. You know, I can't let everybody know what we're doing. You were the best at it. You didn't say three words to us. <laughs> <laughs> no, we really appreciate you coming on, and we're really happy about the YouTube channel that you started again. It's uh, In the Trenches with Trey Thomas, and we're going to ask you a little bit about what's coming next. But my last question is, I know it really stuck out to me at the end of your video about Andre Dillard, you said that the young man deserves an opportunity to start in 2020. Um, we know that there's this kind of lingering, is Jason Peters going to come back or not? Uh, do you feel, though, that when 2020 begins, Andre Dillard will be the starting late left tackle? Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, he's earned the right to do that. I mean, he's a first-round draft pick. That's what you – you brought him in to be the replacement for Jason Peters. You didn't bring him in to sit him on the bench for two years to develop him. And, you know, offensive line is not a position like a quarterback, you know, where you, you bring him in and let him sit for a little while, and then finally when his opportunity comes, you come in. You, you brought him in to start. My rookie year, I came in, first-round pick, here's your playbook, you're starting. You know, so that was the difference in where it is now. But I think that, you know, he's learned a lot, but it's up to Coach Stout to get him ready for the season. I think uh, – when you go back and you look at some of the stuff that Jason Peters was doing, I think that Jason Peters played had a solid season at times, but then you saw him at times where you you, you saw his age on certain stuff, and you know it just kind of was like, dang man, you know, that was something that you know the old JP would have made that look like nothing, and you know now I can kind of see where you know it's just not where it needs to be. But hey man, I think that Andre Dillard is um, he can get there as long as you make sure that you do the job as a coach and get him where he needs to be. All right. What's coming up next uh, on inside our in the trenches with Trey Thomas? What are we going to say? I think right now, since we got Dillard out of the way, I think I want to, um, I'm going to go back and get back to the basics, man. I think what I want to do just so we make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, making sure our lingo is right. I might go through some personnel stuff, uh, go through personnel and then also uh, talk about like the gap system. When we're talking about the A, B, gap, C, gap, inside zone rules, and you know, kind of break it down to some of that and then start getting into some of the protection stuff and start talking about the rules that come into the protection. Get into the X's and O's of it a little bit more so that when I talk to you about a nickel blitz or something that comes in, people are understanding a little bit better because you're going to have the X's and O's that you can go back to. That's amazing. You'll be the professor. Trey Thomas yeah. is how we'll uh, <laughs> how we'll refer to you. I'm not going to sit uh, up here and show you highlights. I want to teach you the game. Excellent. I think that's going to be a great service to uh, everybody, all your listeners, all your followers, the entire football community. So we encourage everybody to subscribe to your YouTube channel, In the Trenches with Trey Thomas. You can also find his work on Twitter, at 72 Trey Thomas. That's T-R-A as uh, for Trey. So uh, that's going to do it for this edition of Inside the Birds TV. We want to thank Trey again. Uh, also, thanks to Hunter Brody, our producer. You can find his work on his YouTube channel, Sports Talk with Broads. And make sure you catch the latest Inside the Birds podcast on any pl uh, podcast platform that you listen to. Also, check out InsideTheBirds.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next edition of ITB TV.